Hello everybody and welcome to Books with Ike. My name is Isaac and today I'm going to be talking about the books that I read in October, November and December. So there are technically two days of December left when I'm filming this, but I doubt I'll finish any more books in that time, so I'm just going to do my wrap up now and hope that I'm right about that. So I read three books in October, six books in November, and one book in December. And without further ado, I'm just going to get on into them. So this is a YA urban fantasy about a boy called Sam, who, as well as being the only out gay teen in his small town in Georgia, is also one of the few people there who is interested in magic, which is seen as the devil's work by quite a lot of people. And so he is struggling with his feelings for another member of his magic club, who is a guy called James. The third member is a girl called Delia, who is stressing over getting into an elite magical college. And James has somehow become involved with a dangerous group of what are called magickers. And that sort of kicks off the plot. I can't say much more than that. So yeah, I had really high hopes for this, but it ended up being just okay. It was compared to the Raven Cycle, and it does not deserve it. For the prologue, the atmosphere is quite good, but the writing style just becomes super bland after the prologue. And there are like moments of very atmospheric writing, but they are just moments. It's not the whole book, unfortunately. The characters are good, the magic system is very interesting from what little we got of it, and I wish it was explored more. And I really liked the focus on portraying parental abuse and neglect, and broken homes, which was really well done. But that's about the extent of my praise for this book. The plot was interesting, but didn't wrap up satisfyingly. And the love triangle was really bland and underdeveloped, and I don't understand why the romantic subplot ended the way it did. So yeah, I mostly liked this book, but like every aspect was just a little bit underdeveloped, and that's really irritating. So yeah, I gave this 3.5 stars. Next I read The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury, and I don't really have much to say about this, this is one of the books I read for uni, and it was fairly interesting, the writing style was pretty good, and lots of the individual short stories were really intriguing and had cool concepts to them. But I only gave this three stars, because my main problem with this book is that the short stories don't form a cohesive whole narrative. It just feels like a very tenuous, loosely connected collection. And I forgot to explain what this is about. This is a classic sci-fi about humanity's repeated attempts to colonize Mars. And then the last book I read in October was The Tarot Sequence Scenes from Quarantine by K.D. Edwards, which is book 2.5 in the tarot sequence, and it is a free novella again, so if you're reading the series, don't skip over it, you can just get it for free. And yes, as I implied in my... I can't remember which of my last two wrap-ups it was, but when I talked about The Sunken Moor, I said that it should have set my expectations for the other novella, because I was expecting this to be just a bunch of, like, cute, funny ficlets, and that's sort of what it was at first. But really, this is about developing the found family dynamic with the new characters. And I can't really tell you what I mean by that without spoiling The Hanged Man, so I'm not going to say any more. But this novella also keeps setting up mysteries for later in the series. And there is something that is brought up in here which I assume is going to be very plot relevant. So I'm looking forward to seeing where that goes. And then the first book I read in November was Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas, and this was definitely my most anticipated book of the year, like, no doubt, and it's also going to be one of my favourites, because I gave this 4.5 stars. This is another YA urban fantasy. This time it is about a trans boy called Yadriel, who is part of a community of brew hexes, and they have a very gendered magic system, where brujos are able to summon the spirits of the dead and release them to the afterlife, and brujas are able to heal. And because he's trans, Yadriel's dad won't let him undergo the ceremony that will grant him his powers. 
So Yadriel performs the ceremony himself in secret. And so he wants to prove himself as a brujo, and by extension as a boy, to his family by summoning the ghost of his recently killed cousin to find out what happened to him. But instead, he accidentally summons the ghost of a boy from his school, and things progress from there. And so, yeah, I love this book. I gave it 4.5 stars. So in my heart, this is a 5 stars. But I did have one massive problem with it, which I can't overlook. So intellectually, it's a 4.5 but I absolutely love this book and think it's flawless at the same time. <laughs> and I'll start by talking about that problem, and that is that right from the start, you know what's going on. The reader knows what's going on. So you're just waiting for the characters to catch up for the entire story. It's incredibly predictable. But that is my only problem with it. And trust me when I say it's a really minor problem. Everything else about this book is absolutely fantastic. Aidan Thomas's love of their culture really comes through in this book. You can feel how much joy they had in writing this, and it is so good. So I don't know much Latin American mythology, and this book made me want to learn more. Because yeah, the magic system is really interesting. The characters are just incredible. They are to die for. Julian, the love interest, is probably the cutest character you will ever read about. He is adorable. The romance is also adorable. And like, Aidan Thomas is able to keep this book very light-hearted, whilst also tackling a lot of very serious themes and topics. So there's like, commentary on the intersection of classism and racism in schools. There's commentary on the stigmatization of ADHD, there's commentary on police racism, and the focus on found family is at once very sweet and endearing, but also heartbreaking because of why it is a necessity. Oh, and the writing style is also incredible. So yeah, this book is extremely impressive. It, it is a fun, cute romance with a great world and a great magic system, that also tackles a lot of really serious topics in a very nuanced and subtle way, and it's just great. So if you haven't picked this book up yet, or weren't planning to, I highly encourage you to do so, because you will not regret it. It is so good. And it also has a great cover, which is a nice bonus. <laughs> Next I have Reverie by Ryan LaSalla. And this was a 5 star prediction, and it definitely lived up to my expectations. I gave this 5 out of 5 stars, it's one of my favourite books of the year, it's now one of my favourite books of all time. But other than being brilliant, this wasn't what I expected at all. So what I'd heard about this before reading it was that it was about a drag queen sorceress and dream magic and a boy so gay he shoots rainbows. And that makes this book sound like a fun romp. I was expecting a comedy, I was expecting a cute romance. I wasn't expecting this. This book is dark as shit. <laughs> um, this book is a deep and dark and, quite frankly, bleak exploration of what it means to be queer and what the place of queerness is in the modern day. It's absolutely stunning. This is about a boy called Kane who wakes up in a hospital bed with no memories. But when he wakes up, he is told by the police that he set fire to a historical landmark and crashed his dad's car into a river. And so he's now under investigation for arson and vandalism, and he has to recover his memories and clear his name. And along the way he gets drawn into some mysteries involving his classmates and stumbles into a surreal, nightmarish dreamscape. So yeah, this book is... Utterly incredible. The way the themes are handled is absolute perfection. The magic system is incredibly interesting. The characters are great. The writing style is beautiful and moody and poetic and lyrical, and I love it. The romance shouldn't work, but is absolutely incredible. The found family element is also great. It's got some exceptional commentary on the importance of queer voices telling queer stories. It has an uncomfortably real 
portrayal of the queer experience. It is so relatable and just heart-wrenching and it, like, just... I've only ever been able to relate to one other book more than I did this one, and reading this book was just cathartic. This book is transcendent. It is just everything I never knew I wanted. I absolutely loved this book, and you should read it. You should absolutely read it, especially if you are queer. If you are queer, I'm gonna call this required reading, even though there's no such thing as required reading for anything, of course. Oh, and I've been saying about how it's so dark and bleak, but that's only the journey. The ending is ultimately very hopeful and empowering, and it is just... it's just incredible. Please read it. It is just amazing. It's one of my favourite books of the year, it's one of my favourite books of all time, and I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Okay? Nice. I have written a full review for this book, which I will leave linked in the description, and it goes a lot more in-depth into my thoughts, and I highly encourage you to read it, because just talking about this, I cannot do it justice, but that review goes very in detail. And after that, I read Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race by Rennie Edo Lodge. Kind of a sharp <laughs> turn into something else, isn't it? So yeah, this is an anti-racist book. I don't entirely know what to say about it. I did love this book, and I highly encourage you to read it. I didn't rate it because I don't think that's appropriate for the sorts of topics that this is about. This is a very British book as well. It goes a lot in depth into the history of not just racism, but just black people in general in Britain, which shockingly we don't know that much about from like school. I learned about a lot of stuff which I had no idea about from this book, in terms of the history, and it also deals with these complex issues in a way that is very easy to understand and comprehend, and so it's not intimidating in the slightest, it's not difficult to read, it's very digestible, but at the same time it covers a lot of topics like systemic racism and intersectionality, and all sorts of things, and it was a really great read, it it was very informative, and I highly recommend it. Then I read Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston, and this is the story of a black woman in America, in the South. I'm not entirely sure of the dates. I think it's like the 1890s or the 1910s, I'm not entirely sure, and she is forced to get married at 16, and the story just follows her life as she grows up. I feel uncultured for not caring about this book. I gave it two stars, but that is entirely down to personal preference, so take it with a grain of salt. I didn't care about any of the characters in this, there wasn't much of a story to get involved in, and the writing is at times so poetic that I can't understand what it's saying. Like, I can read the AAVE fine, it's not that. Like, the narration style was really confusing in some points, and at some points it just goes off on tangents which are not relevant to Jamie's story at all. Seemingly, I could be just being too literal and it's all got a thematic point, but I don't know, it just wasn't for me, I was very bored by it, and I gave it two stars. Next I read The Fell of Dark by Caleb Rorig, and there is a certain story behind this. So, a couple of years ago, or it might have been last year, I don't remember, I stumbled across this YouTube channel which only reviewed vampire fiction. I don't remember what the channel was, sorry. But I just saw one of her videos, and it was like, reviewing all the vampire books I read in whenever the time period was. And I clicked on it thinking, I wonder if there's any MM vampire stuff on there. And there wasn't. And as far as I could tell, there wasn't in any of her videos. So that just got me craving a gay vampire book. And then this was announced. And obviously it's a YA book, so I was not expecting it to be what I wanted, to be this sinister, you know, seductive, sensuous sort of book. But in some parts, it really was. So this is about a boy called August growing up in the town of Fulton Heights, which is not considered a safe place to be because it has a large population of vampires. And so August lives his life in constant paranoia. 
And then weird things start happening. The frequency of vampire attacks is increasing, and weird things are happening to August especially, because he's drawing pictures and forgetting about it. And then a vampire shows up and gives him a cryptic warning about the end of the world. So I really enjoyed this book, I gave it 4 out of 5 stars. I loved the characters, the romance was adorable, there were some really cool action scenes and some cool powers. One thing I really liked about this book was the frank depiction of sexuality, because it doesn't at all dance around the topic with like metaphors or vagueness, it's very direct about August's sexual feelings, which feels a lot more accurate to what I remember being a teenager was like. One thing I didn't really like about this was that the world building was kind of confusing in one very specific way that I can't really talk about because it's a big spoiler. And the plot was also a bit confusing, but at the same time it had some quite predictable twists. But this was really fun, and I do highly recommend it. And if you're looking for uh, polyamory books, I recommend picking this one up. And then the last book I read in November was The Tower of Nero by Rick Riordan, the last book in the Trials of Apollo series. And apparently the last book in the Percy Jackson universe. Or at least, that's what I thought going into it. But anyway, The Trials of Apollo follows the god Apollo, who is stripped of his powers and banished to Earth by Zeus, after the events of the previous Percy Jackson series, The Heroes of Olympus, and he has to prove himself worthy of becoming a god again. And I loved this book, I gave it 5 out of 5 stars, it is absolutely the perfect end to The Trials of Apollo, and again, it seems like it could have been the perfect end to the Percy Jackson series, but it isn't, clearly. If it is, I will feel absolutely cheated, because there is so much stuff that is set up in here for later books, which feels like there are some things set up that are extremely important and we need to see happen, not just infer that they happened, including a crossover between all three of his main series. But yeah, the character development was incredible, the plot was great, there were some really interesting new concepts introduced, and and creatures and stuff like that. We got to see a lot of Nico and Will, which was great. Really, we got to see basically everyone's story wrapped up for now in this. So yeah, this feels like it's supposed to be like a temporary finale, but I need that crossover and I need that Nico and Will series. But yeah, I had theories about how this was going to end, and I was wrong. Um, but yeah, I loved it, I gave it 5 out of 5 stars. It's definitely one of my favourite books of the year. And then, the only book I read in September, and the last book I read this year, was Red Skies Falling by Alex London. This is the second book in the Skybound trilogy, which is a YA high fantasy set in a society where everything revolves around birds of prey, and the most important, deadly and feared of these birds of prey is the ghost eagle, which our protagonists have to capture. So yeah, I enjoyed the first book, Black Wings Beating, but I had some quite significant problems with it, but I loved this book. It is utterly incredible. The character development is just superb. The portrayal of PTSD and depression and, and self-loathing is amazing. The plot is really twisty and unpredictable. All of the characters are great. I hated Niall in the first book. I loved him in this one. I also loved Nick. He's really cool as well. All of the side characters are great. Um, obviously, I still love Bryson and Kylie. The romance was way better than in the first book. They actually have chemistry here. The way that Alex London works bird metaphors and similes and references into the narration is just so well done and it really adds to the world building. The action scenes were really intense and the book itself is just harrowing to read. And there was some really interesting development to the magic system that kind of turns everything we knew about it on its head. And there were some really intriguing mysteries set up for the last book. And I can't wait to see where it goes. I did have one problem with it, and that was that 
one of the things that Alex London did in the writing was actually type out, like, the screams of people and birds, and so instead of just saying, he screamed, it would, it would say, he screamed, ah, <laughs> and it would just, it was always in the middle of these really intense action scenes, and it would just take me right out of it. But that is my only complaint. I love this book, I gave it 5 out of 5 stars, and it's definitely going to be one of my favourite books of the year. So yeah, that was every book I read in October, November, and December. Aside from a few duds, I had a very strong end to the year. Some of my favourite books of the year were in the these last three months, so I'm really glad about that. Some of my favourite books of all time were in these last three months, so I'm really glad about that. Uh, and I'm also glad I held off on filming my favourite books of all time video because of that. If you've read any of these books, I'd love to hear what you thought about them, so please leave that in the comments below. And also tell me what are some books that you've read in, not necessarily those months, but just recently. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. You can follow me on Twitter or add me as a friend on Goodreads if you feel like it, links to both of those in the description and I will hopefully have another video up soon. But until then, thank you for watching. I have been Isaac, and this has been Books with Ike. Goodbye.